right, so here we are on position 20 for the Rook endings, and welcome to Chess Diagnostic, by the way. Um, I'm really excited to be getting back into all these endings and really making videos again. Um, <laughs> you know, I've been kind of in a funk lately with these videos. Uh, I, I made a few and then I just wasn't happy with the quality. And I've really been thinking about how to do it consistently because between running, um, you know, 12 hours a day on a computer, the last thing I want to do is fire up, you know, editing software and then record a video. And I'd rather just sit, sit at a board and just think for myself. Um, which I'm still doing. So I've been consistent with my business and with my personal chess study, but I really want to, you know, get these out every day and at least finish this endgame series. Um, and I have a lot of other plans. Um, I was thinking about an idea for um, a series uh, called What Went Wrong, uh, which is kind of an interesting idea. You know, it's like specific points in the game of what went wrong because a lot of positions or a lot of master games it's you know it, it unless you do that work of figuring out exactly what went wrong you don't really learn anything you just see moves and you know i see a lot of commentators um however popular they are that you know they just go here's what happened and then this is this and you know this is that and then i uh, i didn't i don't really take anything away from those games because there's no what went wrong you know it's just presenting moves and then computer evaluations, which isn't really helpful. Um, and I'm also trying to do that with these end, end games here, because end games are rather dry and boring. Um, but I really like, you know, I think if you know 100 end games, then you'll be able to play them at the master level. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, sorry for the long introduction, but here we are with, uh, well, obviously it's black to move. If it's white to move, then he'll just simply go check and then the rook interposes and then it's checkmate. So uh, this is, if it's black to move, it's a draw. And the reason for that, um, a very important thing to understand in rook end, end games is that if you're defending um, against a pawn when you don't have one, when you're a pawn down, you want to move to as far away from the king, the opposing king as possible, because then you can give checks and that's your biggest hope for a draw really. And so notice if black had moved his rook here, um, I'm trying to right click here or here, then it doesn't work. But if he's on the, the seventh or the eighth um, square away from the king, then he can give continuous uh, horizontal checks. And if the king moves away to try to attack that rook, then he'll come back and attack the pawn. And basically the king has to stay here. All right, so let's get through this position here. It's rather simple. Black just keeps a barrage of checks. And if he moves away, then we win that pawn. Notice that. So. Um, if he tries to play king to e6, then we check him again. And notice this is a tricky position. You can't come back and attack that pawn. Um, so you have to play rook to b8. Now you have to be careful um, about playing something like rook to f6 because there's that inner position check and then we lose because he queens with the support of the rook. Always keep in mind for those uh, intermediary checks in rook end games when there's a pawn. Uh, I know, you know, a couple of years ago when I was playing uh, weaker than I am now, I would miss those. That was kind of a weakness of mine uh, to miss those. You know, you think you're attacking something. But always look for those checks in these rook end games because you can either get checkmated or just lose very simply. All right, so what happens is rook to b8, preventing that check and also uh, queening the pawn. And then if the king comes back, all right, let's go back here. So if the king tries to come back, then you just simply keep checking him again. And there's no progress that can be made. If the rook comes to try to interpose, then the king will just simply come up and there's nothing that can uh, that white can do. Because if he trades rooks, then he wins that pawn. All right, so what happens if the king goes to d7? All right, so then we play rook to b7 check, and we just keep checking. There's nothing that white can do. We're back to the same position. All right, so if you notice, the difference between uh, position 19 and position 20 is that the king is on the, I guess you could say the bishop file, um, but the third square in. And if it was symmetrically opposite, then it would be the same position. Um, now, 
I would suggest you take this position if you really want to study it and figure out um, what will be the setup for uh, for white to win instead of for black to draw. You know, obviously, if the pawn was a square over, then it would be a win. Uh, maybe the king position if it was different or the rook position. So that's really how you want to learn these uh, positions. Don't use a, a computer, set them up on a board and just think about it and you'll really understand these positions. Now, why these simple positions? They're rather boring and simple, but you'll be surprised how if you study end games that your whole game improves. And I know people say that um, <laughs> and they don't believe it, but it's really true. And the reason for that is because you start to think about simple concepts and how they apply to the whole position. And that really changes your mind of how you analyze chess. All right, so thanks for watching. I'll play you out here again. And I look forward to getting more of these videos out on my hike tomorrow. And I'll see you again. Thanks for watching. Bye.